Good morning, everyone. Please find your seats. We're ready to get started. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I hope that those of us joining in person enjoyed your pastries, and those of us joining virtually are comfortable at home with a cup of coffee or tea. My name is Genesis Corella, and I'm the Massachusetts Policy Associate at the Education Trust. I'm delighted to have you all joining us with the along with the Massing Polling Group, sharing new data on parent experiences in K-12 schools throughout Massachusetts. At the Education Trust, we're committed to leading with research and data and advocating alongside educators, parents, students, and policymakers to build an education system from preschool through college where every student has the resources and supports they need to learn and thrive. As our state transitions to a pandemic recovery era, now more than ever, it's critical to ensure all voices are represented at the table. And that includes listening to and uplifting the voices, perspectives, and experiences of families who often get overlooked in meaningful conversations. And today, we set the stage. This event is deliberately planned around community and family voices because theirs are the perspectives that will help us ensure that all students have the resources and supports to thrive. This spring, the Massing Polling Group held three focus groups of racially and geographically diverse K-12 parents across Massachusetts, including our first ever focus group of Latino Spanish speaking parents. The focus groups were an opportunity not only just to hear from parents about their experiences and perspectives, but also to help us shape our most recent poll. Following those focus groups, we use their valuable feedback to inform this parent survey. We asked them about their child's educational experiences this school year, including how they think students are doing academically, their satisfaction with available resources and supports, school safety and security, and more. This is the eighth in a series of polls the Massing Polling Group has conducted starting from October 2020, and it allows us to glean insight into how parents' responses compare to semesters past. I can share so much more about the survey, but I'm sure you all are anxious for us to get started. Uh, so let me just share what you should expect from our time together today. After the presentation of the poll results, we'll hear from Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll. Following her remarks, we'll hear from a rock star panel composed of parents, advocates, and a legislator, and conclude with a question and answer portion. For those of you joining us virtually, you can type your questions by scanning a QR code we'll share during the Q&A portion of the agenda, or you can access it through the Slido link emailed to you prior to the event. The chat and Q&A functions on Zoom are disabled. Uh, but before we jump in, I wanted to let you know that the recordings, the slides, and the data will all be available on the Massing Polling Group's website, as well as the EdTrust Massachusetts site following this event. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce Steve Coxella, president of the Massing Polling Group, who will share results from the statewide survey. Everyone, please welcome me in joining Steve. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. This is a change, seeing everybody in person. I've met several people who I've only seen in box form <clears throat> before today. Um, which was nice to see you in three dimensions. Um, I'm wearing a tie, which I haven't done in a while, so um, definitely things are changing. Um, but uh, and as you'll see, they've been there's a lot of uh, dynamics that parents are going through right now, also, which I think um, we should pause and take a moment to pause and understand. Um, we've all been through a lot in the last three years, and parents are telling us some pretty specific things that you'll see reflected in the poll results that we'll be talking about today. So just a little bit about the survey. Uh, thank you, Genesis, for uh, introducing kind of what the survey is and where it sits in the series of, of polls that we've been doing. Um, we, it, just a, a couple notes on methods. The, the survey that you'll be hearing about is, um, is the eighth wave of a survey series that we've been doing going back to March of 2020. This particular wave has just over 1,500 parents of school aged children across Massachusetts. So as you're listening to the results, what you should be thinking of in terms of what these results mean are, this is a sample, a representative sample of parents. It's representative in terms of geography, um, in terms of race, in terms of the age, the age of parents, education, and other demographic factors. 
The survey was also informed by a series of focus groups, and you'll see that some of the topics that we asked about in the survey were actually suggested by the parents that we talked to in the focus groups. Um, we wanted to understand what was on people's minds as far as um, as far as the issues that that they said that, that they and their children were dealing with, and then we used those results to talk to form the questionnaire and to add topics to the questionnaire to be sure that we were focused on the issues that that were particularly of interest to parents. And we just want to give a huge shout out to the Education Trust for um, for uh, working with us on this and for the, the support that we received from the Bar Foundation that made all this possible. I mean, I just want to say one other shout out to, uh, she's standing in the back of the room, Zaina Basma, who organized all of this um, and helped put all this together um, for all the work that you did on this. Okay, so the key findings will live on our website. I'm going to skip over them because we're about to discuss the key findings in detail, but uh, just a plug for massingpolling.com, which is one of the places that you can find all of these slides. Um, they'll also live on the Education Trust's website as well. So we'll have top lines there. There's cross tabs. If you're thinking, boy, I wonder how this breaks down by region or grade level or gender or race or anything like that, and we didn't show it, all of that information will be on the website in the cross tab. So definitely go there and check that out. So then jumping into the results, the uh, first slide that we're looking at here is um, what, what we asked here is basically for parents to grade, sorry, to uh, grade their ch children's school, basically the same way that, that their children may receive grades, you know, what grade would you give the school based on kind of the whole experience. And what you can see is uh, that most people give pretty positive grades, about three quarters, 77% say that they would give their child's school either an A or a B. Um, and then a few say a C and, and less than that say a D or F. So this is a pretty familiar pattern that we see in a lot of education polling. And it's basically that the closer you get to your own child's experience, the higher the grades tend to be. So if you're talking about your child's classroom or their teacher, the grades are super high. If you're talking about your child's school, they're, then they're high. And it's a little bit lower usually for schools in your district. And then schools in Massachusetts, the grades are even lower and schools nationwide, they're even lower than that. Um, so it's basically more or less the closer to your own child's experience you get, the higher the grades tend to be. Um, we'll see in a little bit though, that there's a lot that goes into this, you know, cause it's not all uniform, it's not all A's. Um, and you'll see that there's pretty different things that parents are thinking about when they, think about this question and arrive at, okay, what would that grade be? It's not just academics. It's not just your own child's teacher. There's a whole range of factors that kind of go into built to parents thinking when they arrive at that. We also asked about satisfaction, um, basically overall satisfaction with your child's school experience. And you can see here in the bar on the, uh, sort of on the left-hand side of the screen, um, that most parents say that they are very or somewhat satisfied. So you're very satisfied to your, <clears throat> the dark blue portion of the bar, somewhat satisfied or the somewhat lighter blue portion of the bar. Um, and then we also then broke that down based on parents who gave their child school an A, which is the set of bars you see right here, or a B or a C through F. And one of the things that stuck out here is that very satisfied actually isn't necessarily all that great. Um, and I say that because <clears throat> when you look out here at parents who gave their child a C through F, this set of bars all the way on the right, you can see that among that group, still about half said that they were very, they were somewhat satisfied, I should say with their, with their um, child school experience. So oftentimes in polling, we group the top two responses and the bottom two responses. And we just say you're satisfied or you're dissatisfied. But I think there's some evidence here that maybe somewhat satisfied isn't necessarily a, you know, a threshold that we should be aiming for. <clears throat> So there's a lot of numbers on this chart and I'll walk you through kind of how to look at it, but basically what it's telling us overall is that there, like I said a moment ago, there are a lot of different things that go into parents' assessments in terms of the grades that they're giving their child school. So basically what we did is we looked at other questions that we'd asked in the survey and then broke those questions down by whether you gave your child school an A, a B, or a C through F. <clears throat> so overall, just to kind of orient you to this, the top row here says, is whether or not your child's school offers any extracurriculars. And you can see that overall, 80% say yes, they do offer extracurriculars. But then if you look out at the next three columns, you can see that parents who gave their child's school an A are considerably more likely to say that there are extracurriculars offered than are parents who gave their child's school a C through F. There's about a 20 point gap there. 
And those gaps, if you kind of scan down the table, then persist on a whole range of different metrics. So they persist on academics, the perception that you think that your child is prepared for the next level. You can see 91% of parents who gave their child school an A think that, that, that their child is prepared, compared to only half who gave their child school a C through F. <clears throat> you can see uh, mental health. If you're concerned about mental health, your <clears throat> um, parents who gave their child school an A were much less likely to be concerned about their child's mental health than were parents who gave their child school a C through F. Um, and safety from violence was another one with parents who gave their child school an A much more likely to say that they think their child is safe than were parents who gave their child school a C through F. Um, and just one more uh, <clears throat> here at the bottom, parents who gave their child school an A, just about 20% of them said their child had been bullied this year, whereas you're up to almost half when you're talking about parents who gave their child school a C through F. So there's just a whole bunch of different factors that go into the question of um, what grade you would give your child school overall. So then looking at some of the other questions we asked, we also asked the question whether or not you think your child is ahead of grade level, behind grade level, or on grade level. And we've been asking this all the way back to the beginning of the pandemic. And basically the way to read this, it, it's a trend chart showing, um, you know, kind of going all the way back to that moment, and you can see that the, the percent who said that the child is at grade level is kind of the top red line here, um, whereas ahead of grade level is the pink line and behind grade level is the blue one. Um, and you can see that it's kind of settled at around a quarter or so who think that, or 20 to 25 percent or so who think the child's ahead of grade level, um, and at grade level is just over half. We also asked basically how concerned are you about your child's academics this year? And you can see uh, this, chart, this chart shows if you're very or somewhat concerned, then you are on this chart. Um, you can see 37% overall are very or somewhat concerned about their, their child's um, academics this year. But there are pretty considerable differences when you break it down a little bit. You can see, for instance, that Black and Latino parents are more likely to say they're very or somewhat concerned about their child's academics than are white parents or Asian parents. Um, I should pause here and just note that all of the waves of the survey included oversamples, um, where we where basically we, we reached more Black parents, Latino parents, and Asian parents to be sure that we could dig in a bit more and understand um, what statewide parent opinion looked like with more nuance. So that's why we're able to break down uh, the results this way. Um, then continuing with this chart, you can see that parents of children who have, um, who have IEPs and parents of children who receive ELL services um, there you're, you're actually up over half with 55 and 60% respectively saying that they're concerned about their child's academics this year. So then looking at ELL services, um, what we asked was basically, are they better, worse, or the same than they were last year? And we see that most people say that they are either better, you'd see that here, 50% or about the same as they were last year. Um, when talking about ELL services. And of course, this is just parents of children who do receive ELL services right now. We then also asked about language development. So has your child's language development improved this school year? Of course, this is also parents whose children receive ELL services. And you can see that 45% said, yes, it has significantly. 34% said, yes, it has moderately. Um, so most parents actually do say that their child's language development has improved this year. This is one of the topics that was suggested by the focus groups, um, sort of spontaneously even, where uh, parents said a lot of things about, maybe there are extracurriculars again, but now they're uh, more expensive, or they're at a different time, or they're harder to access for some reason, um, or there just aren't as many extracurriculars as there were before. These were things that we heard from a lot of the parents in the focus groups that we conducted prior to this poll. Um, so we asked the basic question, does your child's school offer any extracurriculars? We found overall 80% said yes, they do. Um, then we also broke it down by parents of children in different grade levels and found, not surprisingly, that at the high school level there are more extracurriculars um, and relatively fewer at lower grade levels. Um, we didn't actually dig into type of extracurriculars, but that's uh, something that we're hoping to do in future rounds of the survey. 
We also then just asked, okay, well, would you like there to be more? Do you think there should be more extracurriculars at your child's school? And found overall about 40% said yes. Uh, the bars that you see on this chart are the percent of parents who said, yes, there should be more extracurriculars. Uh, that was relatively even, fairly even uh, between uh, white parents and parents of color. Um, you can also see, though, um, more interestingly on the right side of this chart that um, you remember that lower grade level levels had relatively fewer extracurriculars, but parents do want more extracurriculars um, at those lower grade levels. Let me ask one more question, which is getting at another dynamic we heard about in the focus group, which is, are there currently more, fewer, or about the same number of extracurriculars as there were before, before COVID? Um, and the pink bar kind of in the middle of this chart is the percent who said that there are currently the same, basically the same amount as there were. Um, the, and then the red bar over here are the people, or the red portion are the parents who said that there are fewer, and the blue is a uh, percent of parents who said more. So overall, we see about half said that the number are about, is about the same as it was before COVID, and then the rest are divided between thinking that there are either more or fewer um, extracurriculars compared to before. Um, but you can also see if you kind of scan down the chart that uh, white parents are actually the most likely to say that there are more that there are the same amount. Um, and you can see that that particularly black, Latino, and and Asian parents are more likely to say that there are now fewer. Um, extracurriculars than there were before. So what are the barriers to participation? Um, just again, digging into one of the dynamics that we kind of heard about in the focus groups. Um, we asked about three specific ones, time of day, transportation, and cost, and found that there is a bit of difference in terms of what the key barrier is for you and your kids, depending on um, your household income. This was the one that seemed to create the biggest differences. And uh, for Households kind of at, at, with higher income levels, you can see that time of day is a bit more of a uh, prevalent barrier, um, whereas for households with lower levels of income, you can see that uh, transportation and cost are more likely to be um, key barriers for them. Another topic which we've been talking a lot about um, and talking about it for a while now, of course, is mental health. Um, and the question that we asked here and that we've been asking since February of 21 is thinking about your child's mental and emotional health this year, would you say you're very somewhat not to or not at all concerned? Um, and the numbers you see here are the percent who say either very concerned or somewhat concerned. And you can see that the trend actually goes back to February of 2021 on this particular question. Um, so encouragingly, if we're looking for a silver lining, we can see that the levels are not quite, the levels of concern are perhaps not quite as high as they were in February of 21. They've come down a little bit since then, or come down a fair amount since then, and even a little bit since um, even last school year. Um, but they're still pretty high. You know, we still have about half of parents saying they're either very or somewhat concerned with their child's mental health at this point. So still a very high level of concern. And of course, this is just a um, one relatively short time period. If you look at other national surveys, you can look at this going back a long time and not just concerns, but actual prevalence of conditions and that sort of thing and see that, you know, there's been a, a mental health crisis building in, um, among our children for a long time now. And it got much worse during COVID, you know, certainly the levels then kind of shot up during COVID, um, but this is not something that was just introduced by COVID. It's something that was exacerbated by COVID. Um, to follow up on that question, we then asked, are there enough resources? Does your child's school have enough mental health resources to help students who need it? And overall, we found about half said yes. That's the set of bars you see over here. A quarter said no, and a quarter said they don't know. You know, and this it's not always true in a polling question that don't know is important. The number is important, but in this question, don't know is an important number, um, particularly for something this important. We also then broke that this question of are there enough resources down by parents who are the most concerned um, to the least concerned and found that uh, parents who are the most concerned are also the most skeptical of whether or not there are enough resources for uh, to, to deal with to help the children who who need mental health services. 43% um, said that there are not 10% said that they're um, that that they don't know whether or not there are enough resources. Another, this is another topic we've heard a lot about in the focus groups and we have heard a lot about in focus groups kind of go, going back a little ways now is um, bullying and the general question of safety. 
Um, the question here was basically, has your child experienced bullying this year? And overall, 28% of parents said that yes, their child had experienced bullying this year. Um, and then the rest of the chart here is broken down by different uh, groups of parents, different demographics. And just to kind of highlight a couple, you can see that um, parents of children with IEPs and parents of children who receive ELL services are uh, both about 40% who say that their children have been bullied. So bullying does seem to be more common um, among those particular groups of parents, or reports of bullying, I should say. This also then calls back to the earlier slide just about the idea that there is so much more that goes into school grades than just um, than just academics. You know, parents who gave their child school a lower grade were much more likely also to report that, um, that bullying was taking place and parents of children who are behind grade level were also more likely to say that. Um, and then finally, black parents and Latino parents were a bit more likely um, than were white parents to report bullying of their children. We asked about satisfaction with, okay, you're, there is there has been bullying. Are you satisfied with the protocol that the school is following? Um, and you can see that overall, a third say they're very satisfied, 36% say somewhat. Um, and then you can see that if your child's, child has experienced bullying themselves, then your satisfaction level is actually a bit lower with the, with the bullying protocol. Um, this question then shows uh, basically how, how safe parents think their child is from violence. And you can see that overall, we've got about half saying that they think they're very safe. 37% say they're somewhat safe. This is another one, of course, where we could really debate whether uh, if somewhat safe is good enough, you know, whether this is, uh, um, you know, this is the metric we should be shooting for or if we should be trying to expand this kind of red bar down here. Um, and I'd say that this is, when we, we asked a question at the end of the focus groups, basically, what keeps you up at night? You know, that was one of the questions we asked parents. And we're very surprised by how many said safety. You know, is my child safe at school? And they had various stories from, you know, a weapon had been brought, been brought into school or, you know, there had been a lockdown or their child had been bullied or what, just all kinds of different stories. Um, but there definitely was kind of a, a sense that safety was a real issue that, um, that they were worried about and that their children were worried about. We did ask then about the prevalence of lockdowns and whether or not your particular child has experienced a lockdown. Um, we found overall about a quarter said yes, their child had experienced a lockdown. Um, and you can, uh, that's the kind of the dark red bar down here. And not surprisingly, you do certainly see a higher, a more frequent lockdowns um, at uh, higher grade levels. So sort of the high school grade level. Um, <laughs> Uh, we, then this is basically how familiar familiar are you with the emergency response protocols that that exist at your school, and you can see that 38 um, percent of those who's, who for whom there had been a lockdown in their school said they were very familiar, um, which is a bit more than the percent who said that there's not a lockdown. So not surprisingly, that experience in this case has brought has uh, brought familiarity. Um, and then there's just a couple more slides. Um, I just want to kind of uh, go through a, a, um, just a couple more slides. I want to skip, skip a couple just because in the interest of time, but just again, these are all on our website. Um, what this question is, is does the presence of police officers or student resource officers make your child feel safer, less safer? Is there no difference? And basically what you see is overall 63% say more safe um, and 25% say no difference. Um, we then broke it down by race here, and you can see, uh, you can kind of see how the numbers, the numbers break down. Um, we should note that, uh, particularly among Black parents, there's a bit, lo bit of a, a bit uh, fewer Black parents say that their child that it makes their child feel more safe, um, and more Black and Latino parents say that it makes their child feel less safe. Even though in both cases it's a majority who say more safe. Um, we then also asked about alternative approaches. Basically, does your child's school offer alternative approaches such as peer mediation or restorative justice before the traditional discipline process? Um, overall, 28% said yes, that's the bar on the left. But this is another one where the percent don't know is actually quite interesting. You know, a huge number of parents just don't know at all whether or not uh, alternative approaches are existed, exist at their child's school. However, when among the parents who do know that they exist, that's what you see here, um, how effective do those parents think that they are? And overall, 80% say that they're very or somewhat effective, 
And then you can see here that um, black and Latino parents, particularly the dark red um, bars um, on the bottom say that they are, uh, are, are more likely to say that they are very effective. Parents of color in general, Asian parents also are more likely to say that. So that is a whirlwind tour of some of the highlights of the poll. Um, like I said, all the poll materials are on our website, um, but I'm gonna hand it back to Genesis to introduce our guest of honor. Thanks, Steve, for your overview of the data. I think the poll findings really elevate parents' concerns about their child's social, emotional, academic, health, mental health, and really reinforces the need for state and local education leaders to listen to parents' voices and act with the greatest urgency. Um, and to do just that, I have the pleasure of introducing a state leader who understands the importance of parent voice and is a longtime advocate for education, Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll. As Salem's mayor and now Lieutenant Governor, we were and still are really deeply encouraged by your leadership. You've always led with your commitment to collaboration, pushing for investments to support teachers and students. Uh, under your leadership, Salem became one of the first communities in Massachusetts to adopt the expansion of free, high quality early education opportunities. And you played a significant role in the Student Opportunity Act and ensuring equitable, equitable distribution of those funds. Uh, we sincerely appreciate you uh, coming today and having somebody like you on Beacon Hill, and we couldn't be more grateful that you're joining us. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Lieutenant Driscoll. Thanks so much. Great to be with you. What a beautiful morning this is, too. Not a bad view uh, looking out my, the window here. Thank you, Steve and Genesis, and you know all of you who are here really focused on ways we can improve our education. Um, I know we're, there's going to be panelists and certainly audience members. I, I really appreciate the fact that, Counselor, nice to see you, that we have such a, a strong commitment to public education and to continuous improvement. You know, as I think about today's announcement, I always look at things through a lens as um, certainly a local leader who spent 17 years chairing our school committee. And I'm reminded during a lot of our school reform education efforts, trying to make sure we were delivering for our students, of um, a favorite daughter of Massachusetts, Abigail Adams, who often was quoted as saying, learning is not attained by chance. It must be sought for with ardor and attended to with diligence. I think it really speaks to our desire in Massachusetts to continually find environments where we can ensure that all of our students are being well served by our public schools. It's certainly a duty we have to the next generation and the, I think the groups that are here today really recognize and value that responsibility. You know, there's no doubt in my mind that we're at a pivotal moment for education in Massachusetts. School districts across the Commonwealth are dealing with the impacts of the pandemic on student learning and student well-being, while at the same time facing staffing shortages. And certainly many of the school leaders that I interact with feel like they just stormed Normandy, you know, at a time when our students need them now more than ever. There's a lot of fatigue within the work we had to overcome around the pandemic. And, you know, we're continuing to confront significant and longstanding challenges around opportunity gaps. I say that as the mayor of a gateway city who taught in multiple languages and we had kids in classrooms, my own, uh, where you had great wealth and where you had great need. And so it was a real diversity of students within, um, within any classroom setting. And while this is certainly a time of challenge, um, I also think it's a time of opportunity. There's a lot of upsides. We've seen that from some of the data, some of the parental responses. We know we have resources, more resources than we've ever had to do some of this work. We have tools like the data being presented today. Um, the results of this survey could certainly help guide how we think about the work ahead. We have skilled and just completely dedicated educators working in districts across the state. We know that we have a lot of smart, caring adults who come to work every single day, trying to make sure there's a light bulb going off, uh, going above ahead of a student. And that is something that, you know, is shown in this in this survey, the good grades that most parents continue to give their children's schools account for the caring and dedicated educators we have working across 351 cities and towns. You know, I think we have a chance to really regroup and reimagine what a successful and thriving school environment looks like. We did learn a lot during the pandemic. We learned that we, when we had to do something, we could. 
we pivoted completely to making sure every child had, you know, a Chromebook in their hand and all of our curriculum was available. And it wasn't perfect. It was pretty messy, um, but we did it. And so if we can do that because we had to, I know that our schools and our school leaders and our parents and our students can come together to think about how they can regroup and reimagine how we better serve all kids. It feels like to me very much like the ingredients are here, like how do we improve the recipe? <laughs> And I think the challenges are clear. There's no doubt from the data um, that the survey shows we still have a lot of work to do to create safe and emotionally supportive school environments for all of our students. We hear this from students, particularly our adolescent and teen students who often are struggling to engage um, and who report like higher bouts of anxiety, depression, especially coming out of this pandemic. I mean, some of the CDC data, in addition to the work like this, really shows we have a lot of sad teenagers right now. And it's something that we need to confront. Like, we cannot turn away from that. And I, it's one of the reasons that I think uh, Governor Healy and myself are really deeply committed to improving school environments and so grateful to have Secretary Pat, Tut Tut Pat Tutwiler as the Secretary of Education. And, and just a word about Pat, because um, I think he brings such a special commitment to these efforts. Uh, many of you may know he is a former educator in BPS among a num number of districts, also a superintendent in Lynn uh, Gateway City School. And I think he just knows firsthand the importance of the importance and the challenges of meeting our students needs where they're at and the importance of developing safe and supportive environments for teaching and learning, especially for our students who need us the most. You know, even before the pandemic, um, our mental health services represented a crucial yet often underfunded aspect of supporting our children and our families. Um, and now more than ever coming out of this pandemic with some of the data we're seeing, we know we have to do better. I think it's one of the reasons the administration and the work that we're doing in concert with local districts is focused on expanding mental health services in schools and making sure schools have the structures in place to meet those social and emotional needs. Um, the FY24 budget that we proposed has the largest dollar amount increase in K-12 education funding in our state's history. And the partnership with the legislature is just amazing. I see uh, a representative from Haverhill here who has been so committed to ensuring that our, our students have not only the resources they need uh, tied to dollars, but things like our uh, ability to have universal school meals. Um, the Student Opportunity Act um, now in full fruition is helping so many districts ensure that they have the dollars they need to be able to provide the guidance counseling services, the social work services, invest in those anti-bullying strategies and other social and emotional supports to really build that into the culture. I was struck by the bullying data that 30% of our, nearly 30% of our parents reported, you know, still having a child experiencing bullying in schools even though there's been years of us having anti-bullying curriculum. How do we just not have curriculum, but build that into the culture when there's so much division happening in the outside world of our schools? Really critical point for us to think about as, as adults and school leaders. You know, the budget proposal also includes additional funding for universal mental health screeners, something that Secretary Tutwiler felt um, very serious, felt very strongly about our K through 12 schools having these screeners who can allow us to better identify and address the mental health needs in our students. You know, and at the same time, student well-being we know goes beyond social emotional learning. As I mentioned, we know there are issues that students bring into our schools, whether that's housing insecurity, food insecurity, or just a difficult family situation. And that's one of the reasons uh, we all need to get smarter about how best to address that full continuum of student need. Um, we were pleased to be able to sign, to put in place as one of our first acts in this new administration supplemental budget to ensure universal school meals. It brings a smile to Representative Vargas's face. It does to mine as well. Um, folks who realize that our students can't learn when they're hungry and they shouldn't have to be. And this was a resource that you know began during the pandemic that we are excited to see it continue to move forward. I think we're also doing more to engage students in their education and address student needs in a way that's equitable. A big part of that is student voice. Our young adults, like they're older than, than we were when we were their age. And we know that student voice is an important aspect of building better engagement within our schools. Uh, many of our high school students sometimes feel a disconnection that what am I learning today? Is it connected to what I might be doing in the future? 
And we know it's really clear when students feel respected and part of their learning voice, when they feel like their voice matters, their educational outcomes improve. Many of our efforts tied to bolstering um, the high school experience or tied to high school redesign. You look around this room, I don't know who the oldest person in this room is, but I guarantee you, your high school experience looks very similar to what high school looks like today in many of our classrooms. You pick your classes, you go to your schedule, it's pretty rigid. And we know our students are telling us they want something di different. Um, so bolstering high school redesign, early college, career pathways, part of an effort to boost student engagement and connect again, what kids are learning in the classroom to what they might wanna do after graduation. You know, I think one part of the survey that also bears further discussion is the data that shows parent satisfaction with their child's progress is significantly lower for parents who have English language learners or who have students with disabilities. I think Massachusetts educational leaders have long said, like, no matter how highly our public education system ranks nationally, we can't just be number one for some. We have to deliver excellence for all of our students. It's too important. Uh, it's too important to just dismiss uh, the, the demographics that lead to students not doing as well. And it's certainly for us an area of continued growth. Some of the opportunities to do more here will be supported by the Fair Share Act investments, enabling us to put more resources into things like universal pre-K, especially starting in our gateway cities. If we're gonna think about this in an equitable way, our gateway cities are the places that have more of our vulnerable population. And again, expanding those uh, high school um, opportunities through early college and career pathways, not just in vocational schools. We need to do it there and there's long waiting lists. We, we understand that, but also in our comprehensive schools where we're also seeing students who want that hands-on learning and those opportunities to think about the connections between today and tomorrow. Obviously, we have to continue to prioritize equity for students of color, our English language learners, our students from low-income families, and students with disabilities who continue to be disproportionately affected by some of the major crises happening across America and frankly across the Commonwealth. I really want to thank Mass Inc for their longstanding work with respect to public ed accountability. The results of this store of this survey underscore the critical need for all of us, state and local leaders, as well as our nonprofit partners, to listen to the voices of parents and to act with urgency to provide all children with the resources and supports they need to thrive. We can't get there overnight. I used to be so frustrated as a school committee leader because if you weren't planning for it in spring, it wasn't happening in September. And if it didn't happen in September, it's not happening until next September. And so I ask all of us, like, how do we work together to bring a sense of urgency to this work? And to maybe understand that it's not gonna be 100% perfect when we roll out improvements, but we're willing to be part of that messy transition. Um, the flexibility that we all displayed because we had to, We've got to bring that back into our classroom efforts and to support our educators with that level of uncomfortableness, <laughs> becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable in an aim and an effort towards improving our educational experience for our kids. I think this survey represents some of the most important stakeholders to help us do that, to help us bring that sense of urgency, and that's parents. As much as we can do at the state level, education is delivered locally. There's 351 cities and towns. I think there's 262 school districts. A lot of what's happening in a classroom is decided by on the ground, close to where people live. And so the more engagement we can have from adults, from parents, can really go a long way toward improving what's happening in our communities. And I, I really do want to credit the survey designers, Steve and his team, for building equity into their approach of uh, engagement in this representation that parents and not just parents grandparents key family members we know we need that social capital of someone in a child's family and i think for us thinking about how we can ensure whether it's parent teacher conferences or classroom open houses or home visits how can we be relentless in engaging family members in their language at a time and place that works for them that meets the needs of a working family and engage them about their child's progress as a as a commitment to improving our communities if you want to look at what our future workforce is going to look like or what our future leaders are going to look like, go into a classroom today. And how are we making sure we're engaging the folks that matter most in the lives of those children? So I really want to thank all of you for being here today, for doing the important work, for analyzing this data, discussing how we can improve education both locally and from the state level. I think through these conversations, I'm confident we can craft these solutions to better serve our students 
ensure the Massachusetts education system lives up to the promise for excellence of all in a place where free public school began, in a place that has a constitution enshrining the right to an equitable public education for all. We are seeing parts of the country backing away from this commitment, trying to divide students, not here in Massachusetts. So it's our job to sort of double down on the promise of our public schools to make sure our educational system continues to meet the moment and provide each child with the opportunity to access the best education, no matter the circumstances, to ensure, as Abigail Adams said, that learning is not attained by chance, but it's something that we're willing to fight for and give ardor and attendance to with diligence. Uh, again, it's, it's great to be part of a of an ecosystem in the Commonwealth that cares deeply about education, that fights about the right way to do things, but at the heart of it, at the heart of it is making sure we're providing for all of our students. Thanks for all you're doing and for being here today. On behalf of the Education Trust and the Massing Polling Group, Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll. Uh, thank you for joining us today, both to hear directly from families and community leaders about what's working in our state and what we can do better. Um, thank you so much for sharing your commitment to education equity in the state and for allowing us to learn a bit more about the state, uh, the state initiatives that you're leading. We're really energized and ready to roll up our sleeves and join you to do the really hard but necessary work to improve the education uh, system. And now I have the pleasure of digging deeper into the content context of these results with an expert panel led by my esteemed colleague Shanti Lopes, Assistant Director for Engagement and Communications at the Education Trust Massachusetts. Shanti, I'll let you do the honors of introducing our panel. Thank you, Genesis, for the warm welcome and good morning, everyone. Uh, just a reminder to those joining us by Zoom, you received a link to submit questions. And if you're a part of the audience and have a question, just hold off and we'll be coming around with microphones a little later on. And now I have the introduction. I know Steve said honorable, but I think our panel is just as honorable that we have today. So I have the pleasure of uh, welcoming our panel to the stand, uh, stage to, uh, today. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. We are really grateful. Uh, they are here today to not only react to the poll's findings, but to also share a little bit about their perspectives and experiences as well. Um, I'm going to give you just a moment to introduce yourselves. I'm going to ask you to please say your name, your organization, uh, your role, how many children you have, if that applies to you, and anything else that you would like to share. However, although I know that you have probably a long list of accomplishments, let's make sure it's short enough maybe to fit in a tweet, since we will have opportunities to dig a little deeper into your background as the conversation progresses. Uh, so I'll start with Richard. I believe so. You'll... Oh, good morning, everybody. My name is Richard Carter. I reside in, in uh, Taunton, Massachusetts, and my wife and I have a sixth grader at the John F. Parker Middle School. And I just wanted to be a part of this forum. Um, I come from a long line of educators, so it's very important to me. It's in my blood. I think it's important. It's really the only thing I know, and um, I want the best for every child. So that's why I'm here today. Hi, uh, my name is Carrie Rodriguez. I'm Matthew Miles and David's mom. Uh, I'm also Max and Dylan's bonus mom. We have five little boys in our house from 10 to 15. So, so nice to be with adults today. Uh, I am the founder of Massachusetts Parents United and the president of the National Parents Union. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Leon Smith. I'm an attorney and the executive director at Citizens for Juvenile Justice. We're an independent statewide nonprofit organization that advocates for systemic reform to pursue equitable youth justice. I'm also the proud parent of a 20 year old who just completed his sophomore year in college. So I'm going to get through it. God bless you. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Andy Vargas. I'm the state representative for Haverhill. I'm the vice chair of the Economic Development Committee uh, and the vice chair of the Black and Latino Caucus. I have a 15 month old uh, named Ruben and a dog named Merengue, who's two years old. <laughs> Thank you all for introducing yourselves. 
Um, I have the pleasure of knowing you all, but it's always refreshing to hear a little bit more about you um, and what drives us. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that our audience is ready to hear from all of you. Um, as a reminder, uh, Q&A uh, could be submitted uh, through the link and we'll get uh, after the panel, we'll do 15 minutes of Q&A. So um, I'm gonna ask each and every one of you to answer the following questions. So having heard from Steve a little bit about the findings from the survey, um, just curious of your initial reactions and digging a little bit deeper, um, given your work and your experience, which you all shared, was there anything in particular that really resonated with you? And was there anything that you were really surprised about or not so much? Um, and as, as I mentioned before, I would love for each you all to answer the question, but whoever is ready first, uh, feel free to get started. I'll go ahead first. Um, I just made some notes here. I think the findings are pretty accurate. Um, going years back, working with youth from different backgrounds, um, these numbers are not surprising when you look at um, who has the resources and who does not. And um, other re data or research shows that children that have the the right resources um, excel and do do well um, better than the ones that don't. So I think the the, the parents and and the folks that were in the the polling group, um, I think what they shared with us is pretty accurate. Thank you. I was not surprised by anything uh, that I saw, but I just you know. I want to reflect on the how important it is to double click and ask deeper questions about what was revealed so, for instance, safety being a top pr priority for parents. Um, this is something that we you know see here in the Commonwealth, but also across the country, but safety means different things to parents. Now, your initial thought would be like, oh my God, we see on the news all the time that like kids are getting gunned down in classrooms. Like this is a tragedy, a crisis in our country, but that's not the only thing that parents think about when we think about safety. Two weeks ago, I spent a bunch of time with a, a group of parents that are organizing in Roxbury around safety. Now, are you thinking, oh my gosh, they're worried about crime and violence? No. What they're concerned about, you know, their kids are not safe because their kids are going to, to school in a building that has high levels of lead in the water. And, you know, they, they've got kids who are in first and second grade and all the school has done is put up stickers on, on the fountains that say, don't drink this water, this, this water is not safe. That This school has an 8% proficiency level in reading. The kids don't know what that means. And so their kids are coming home saying like, and, and they're being asked questions like, oh, are you drinking the water? Oh, not from the water fountain, but I, I go in where I wash my hands in the sink and I get water from there. You know, and so they're very worried that their kids are not safe. Or we talk with, with parents, I'm, I'm a mother of a child with special needs, kids who are not safe in transportation. You know, that's why I'm, I'm so excited to be on a panel with Rep Vargas, who is listening very closely to parents who are deeply concerned about whether or not during transportation to school, whether or not our kids are safe, because bus drivers and aides sometimes are not trained in de-escalation strategies. So when you have a child that's overstimulated and presenting a behavior within the scope of their diagnosis, you have folks that will call the cops on these kids instead of getting them safely to school. So it's really important that we don't just generically assume we know what parents mean when they say, oh, they're concerned about safety. We, this is the start of a conversation, not the end of one. And so this is where the work should really be beginning. So well said. Um, both the conversation around safety and solutions to safety need to be much broader than they've been presented. Um, two things really jumped out to me in looking at the survey, nothing surprising. But just really quickly, two things just grab my attention. One is parental concerns around mental health and the fact that parents feel that not enough is being done. We can't lose sight of the fact that we went through a global pandemic and that really created a 
adolescent mental health crisis. We can't be so concerned with getting back to normal or the perception of normal that we lose sight of that. And that if we don't address students' social, emotional, and mental health needs, they are not going to be able to learn. So to me, that served as a reminder. The second thing that jumped out, and I'm so happy Madsink really looked at extracurricular activities. When we look at the picture of what's critical to a child's educational experience, extracurriculars are not an appetizer. They're not an after dinner meant. They're part of the main course of a child's education and quality education. When I think back to things that really made me excited to go to school, what math class? Mm -hmm. It was the ability to participate. Those are things that gave me a sense of belonging, a sense of school pride, and the fact that we have disparities, the fact that parents of color are citing that they have fewer opportunities, the fact that you can live in a certain town, and depending on what school your kid goes to, they may have less access to those things. That's something we need to continue to track and we need to continue to address. It's easy to look at a, a, a number and say, oh, rate of chronic absenteeism, school disengagement. Well, are we providing those types of opportunities beyond the classroom that connect with students and really draw them into the school community? So I was really happy to see that and I hope Massing continues to look at that as a very crucial factor. Yeah, I think that's very well said. And if extracurriculars are a part of the main course, then I think parents and students are really hungry for it. Um, and, you know, one of the other takeaways that I got from this poll was, um, you know, something that we all already know is that there's an information and perception gap as well, right? You know, white parents thought that extracurriculars were about the same or more, uh, but uh, parents of students of color uh, thought the opposite by and large. Um, and I think it brings up an important point that um, we have to view uh, or a lens that we have to understand as we try to break down this poll or any education policy. And that is that these decisions are incredibly local uh, and rely on the work that's happening at the local level, right? And that's individual outreach to parents, uh, strong uh, family engagement teams. And I think whenever I think about school policy, I always come back to the fact that, you know, in municipal elections, particularly in gateway cities, 20% turnout is a really good year, right? And school committees uh, control and influence so much of the decisions that happen. Um, and I don't think they receive enough time and attention uh, that they deserve um, for the amount of power, responsibility, and uh, potential uh, that they have to really put a dent into many of the challenges that we see here. Uh, and so I think we just have to keep that lens in mind that you know, it's great and it's important for us to have these discussions at the state level. We have to continue to provide resources to uh, cities and towns. So the Student Opportunity Act is doing that. Uh, but at the end of the day, the decisions around how to spend that money, how to invest that money, uh, how to educate parents on alternatives to um, discipline, uh, how to solve the transportation challenges that we're having. Those are very hyper local decisions that are happening. And we need to make sure that we're investing our time and resources and creating the conditions so that parents can have a meaningful say at the table and that we lessen the information gap uh, that we see in these polls. Thank you all for sharing. I think I heard a lot of um, commonality um, and definitely uh, heard the sentiment of making sure to really understand what we mean when we talk about safety and also the approaches uh, that we uh, sort of pursue to tackle some of the safety concerns. The next question is uh, for Richard. In the poll, we asked parents if they believe that the child's grades uh, really represented their academic performance and ability. And what we found that only about half of parents felt that it did uh, very well, with most saying only somewhat well. So I'm curious from your perspective as a parent, do you believe that uh, the child's grades are perhaps the best indicator um, to be able to uh, measure academic performance? And what other indicators uh, do you look to? And also curious, not only from your perspective, but what are the types of things that you're hearing from other parents? Yeah. So I, I do think that her grades are a good indicator, but it's not the only indicator. Um, my wife and I, we try to find out what she's learning if she has the ability to learn problem solve those kind of things um i don't know if a lot of parents have that sense of, of awareness to um be able to communicate with the school um but overall I, grades are a, a, 
a good indicator, but some of the things we talk about, um, the extra, uh, extracurricular activities, those kind of things. Um, I know how important it is for her to be more well-rounded, um, how to, you know, learn to communicate, how to socialize, those kind of things. Um, so those are some of the things I look at from the school's perspective um, that we want her, um, not just her grades. Um, so, and her ability to um, develop the skills to move into the next level, you know? So when she gets into high school, she's ready to, to figure things out and, and she knows how to learn, um, so. Thank you. And I think you touched upon what Steve said earlier that there's many factors that go into um, into how parents sort of decide uh, their overall uh, grades or, or satisfaction with the school. I know that, as I mentioned before, many of you wear different hats from a 15 month old to a 20 year old. Um, maybe uh, Rev Vargas won't be able to answer this question, but I'm, I'm or maybe you will. Uh, curious if you guys would like to add on to the question. If not, we'll go on to the next. I have a lot of report cards in my house. I'm like a lot of report cards. Um, yeah, I I don't have a lot of confidence in report cards. Um, not because just what I have, you know, the blessing to do for a living and I can look at the data and, you know, all of this stuff, but just personally, you know, I, I have a son right now who is on the honor roll in his school, A's and B's. Great kid, awesome kid. Um, but it is also quite clear to me as a parent that he is struggling to read and write sentences and spell at the end of sixth grade. Um, but when I go and ask questions about that, I'm not given that information reflected on the report card. And the district that he is in right now has suspended star reading testing. So I can't even get like an independent look at like where he really is grade level. So uh, in that circumstance, I was so deeply concerned that like we literally took him to Sylvan Learning Center so he could get a star test because according to the report cards and all the data I'm receiving from his school, he's fine. There's nothing to worry about. He even has a strong sense of social justice, which I love. Great kid. Um, see, I'm not sure if he got that from the school, but <laughs> love that he has it. But when I get the data back, from an independent test that tells me and confirms for me that he is two and a half years behind grade level. You know, and I have to go in and fight with like a group of educators that I'm not crazy. No, what I was seeing when he was struggling to write about Roberto Clemente was clearly a struggle. And there, there was evidence there. Like I have the ability to, to go and do that. Not every parent does. And not every parent wants to, frankly. When we were talking about the parent engagement piece, that's that's a a critical piece of this. I think we have an opportunity because of the pandemic, we've seen so much play out in our living rooms around you know, parents seeing what education really looks like. But a lot of us you know, have direct lived experience. The parents of today are the, the failed students in many cases of the last generation. And there's not been a lot of restorative justice. So we kind of go into this being a little suspect about engaging and whether or not it's safe. So I think until we unpack that and start to address that, this this you know fairy tale we have in our minds that like everyone's just coming into this conversation brand new, that's not the case for many of us. But I have two kids that go to a school that's named for the man who expelled me from high school. You know, I have some baggage there, and I'm I'm ready to protect him because I'm worried that he's going to go through the same thing. So I think there's a lot that we have to understand. And instead of indicting parents for not showing up and doing what we want them to do, maybe being a little bit more understanding that there's some lived experience there. We've got some work to do, some restorative justice work to do with the parent community. Uh, thank you. Uh, Leon, or, okay, moving on to the next question. Um, mic drop, mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> How do you lead after that, right? Um, uh, Carrie, actually, the next question is actually for you. Um, I know that the National Parents Union uh, does surveys on parents nationally on a lot of the same uh, topics that we covered in the poll. I'm just curious, um, based on what you're hearing nationally and also Massachusetts, what's the same and what's different among uh, sort of uh, concerns with parents? I think they really line up. They, they really do. I mean, we ask very specifically, like, what are your priorities right now as a parent? Uh, we ask questions a little bit differently because it's not just based around education, because um, 
you know, parents don't have students, we have children, right? And so we're, our, our list of priorities, education is important, but right now economic issues are really, you know, putting parents in a very difficult situation. So the fact that SNAP benefits are under attack because of the debt ceiling conversations, if it's dominating and taking up a lot of space. When we talk about education, safety, mental health concerns, the fact that our children are not having learning loss addressed with the urgency we expected, those are the top concerns. You know, we, we can see quite clearly, it's very evident to parents that parents that, that children are behind, they're struggling to learn how to read. It's very frustrating for parents to discover in Massachusetts where we love to sit here and say, we're number one, we're number one at 38% proficiency in reading for third graders. Like, why are you bragging about that? That's insane. So like, I mean, nationally it's 35%. So, hey, you know, three points ahead, but we're, that's what we're satisfied with. Like, that's what we're excited about. 87% of American families in our, our poll want a, a federal right to read in proficiently, proficiently in third grade. Like they think that's, that's a no brainer and that we should be putting, you know, a lot of energy behind that. So I would say, you know, Massachusetts parents are not outliers. You know, our concerns are the same. They're very similar. Um, but I think what we also see is that they they very desperately want to be part of the conversation. And that's toothpaste that kind of got out of the tube during the pandemic. We were invited to the table and we had things to say. And we were seeing this played out in, in, in living rooms, you know, again, like watching this go down on Chromebooks. And now, like, we're, we're engaged. We want to be a part of the conversation. So I don't think that that is unique to Massachusetts. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's definitely in line with what we're seeing nationally. Thank you. And as, as a, a follow up into the sort of national and, and local context, in the poll, only 32% of Massachusetts parents overall said they believe their child is very safe from bullying and 48% um very safe from violence at school um as we mentioned before we conducted focus groups um to help us shape the, the poll and we really heard a lot about parents around the concerns with violence and bullying how does what you're hearing about safety and bullying in massachusetts align or differ from what you're hearing nationally well i think you know we ask questions a little bit differently but to us like bullying mental health all of these things are, are interconnected when you see parents now talking about bullying being a concern, some of them are concerned that their child is being bullied. Some parents are concerned that their children are becoming bullies because we've had a mental health crisis amongst our children. And we know the, the phrase hurt people, hurt people, little hurt people, hurt people and act out in different ways, right? And so identifying that as part of a mental health problem. Our kids need help. Like they're acting out this way and they're they're some of them are staying home, which is why we're seeing, you know, lower like an absentee crisis, but like some of them are acting out and fighting in the classroom or in the hallway or at the flagpole or down the street. We work with a lot of parents. I'm thinking about my Chelsea parents right now who are very frustrated because they're arguing with the school district and the police department over who's going to solve their bullying issue because the police say it's a school issue, the school says it's a police issue. The bottom line is our kids are hurt and not okay. And that's gonna manifest and in, in, in come up in different ways for parents. This is why we have to ask more questions and be in deeper community with parents and families. So we can tell you that, so you can better understand that. Thank you for sharing. That's an interesting point as well that you brought up about potentially the, parent, uh, the, the parents had expressed their child becoming a bullying as a result of all the trauma and mental health that has happened over the last couple of years because in the focus groups we heard a lot about parents concerns but um i think naturally as parent as a parent myself you know they more expressed um it's happening to my child but not my child so i think that's a little bit different than um what we heard so thank you for sharing and i actually want to build off that question that i just asked carrie i'm gonna um kick it to you leanne um so uh, as we sort of been saying throughout today's conversation increased violence um, in schools, particularly for uh, middle and high school students. Um, we also heard that only 40% of Black and Latino parents say their children are very safe from violence compared to 50% of white parents who say their child are very safe. Uh, but this is, we know that this is not only um, happening in Massachusetts, as uh, uh, sort of Carrie just shared with us, this is a, a trend across the country. 
And a response has been from many state and local leaders um, to call for increased uh, SROs, uh, metal detectors, surveillance in schools, um, and other uh, measures to harden against um, threats and safety. So I'm just curious, given your expertise, uh, how effective are these approaches in mitigating harm and reducing risk? So before I get into the research we've done at CFJJ, I want to build off what Carrie said, and it's important that we really get to the root. Far too often, we talk about mental health over here and school safety over here, and we have to understand that they're really integrated. And what we have to really focus on is how can we make our schools more restorative? How can we make them more trauma responsive? Notice I didn't say trauma informed because I don't want you just to be informed. I want you to be able to respond to the struggles that a kid brings into the schoolhouse door and, and really healing centered. Um, and, and that's how we have to really approach these issues at their root. But you asked about really school hardening measures. So with CFJJ, we're a policy organization, but at our root, we're also a research organization because we believe that policy should be grounded in research in data and best practices, because it's important that we advance policies that have an evidentiary basis at being effective. So as these conversations have taken place around metal detectors in schools, we say, okay, there are people who they hear these ideas and they think, wow, this is something we should do. We step in and say, let's look at the research to really see if they're as effective as people think that they are. Um, when I began doing the research on our for our metal detectors report, I came across a quote from a national security, a national school safety expert named Dr. Ken Trunk. And he coined the term security theater. And he said that in relation to metal detectors and cameras and other things that um, you hear advance often. And he used that term because these approaches are tangible. They're things that people can see. And because they're of their visibility, they can create a feeling of safety. But then he cautions and calls them an emotional security blanket because although just seeing those things can make a parent or maybe a kid feel safe, they don't actually make schools safer. So in our recent report, metal, uh, metal Detectors, we looked at 15 years of research. And across that span of time, each of those studies found insufficient evidence that placing a metal detector at the front door either increased safety or decreased crime or violence in schools. There was also an equity component because for schools that are 50% or more of color, those schools are 18 times more likely to have a metal detector. And because of that bias and implementation, black children in this country are five times as likely and Latinx students three times as likely to pass through a metal detector. So in addition to lack of effectiveness, in addition to cost that could be going to make our schools, more healing center, more trauma responsive, more mental health. It has an impact on young people. We talk to young people about this. They talk about how metal detectors make their schools feel less welcoming, like they have less freedom, like they have less privacy. Um, it has an impact. We want our schools to be welcoming spaces and safe spaces and metal detectors do the opposite of that. Pivoting to Policing, because you asked about SRO, similarly, when this debate was going on in 2020, we said, let's go to the research. The statistic that showed that Black parents were two and a half times as likely to feel less safe with an SRO in their school is not surprising uh, based upon our research. So again, 12 studies across 10 years, none of them found that placing an SRO in the schools had a positive school safety impact, but they did find that SRO in place placement, it increased school-based arrest, especially for black and brown students and for students with disabilities, which as the parent of a student with disabilities always hits me because you have behaviors 
that are a manifestation of a child's disability and when districts aren't putting resources into special education to address needs and then those behaviors arise, not only are we looking at school exclusion, we're looking at the added trauma of arrest on your most vulnerable students. Um, so, but then, and I'll just end on this, it has a detrimental impact on school climate. When kids are seeing their friends being stopped and searched, um, which adds trauma in and of itself, there are multiple layers of negative impacts there. So when we talk about school safety, we can't artificially limit the conversation to these two approaches, which at the end of the day, quite simply, lacks lack evidence that they're actually effective at making school safer. Thank you, Leon. And I'm actually gonna switch things up a little bit. I already got the time check, but I think based off what we heard today, um, I think it is important to hear a little bit from you on what are more effective approaches, um, whether that it's through your research or through best practices, either throughout the country or the state that you can share. Again, skipping things around, but I think it's important for you to follow up. Yeah, I'll be quick. So the fact that 42% of parents are unsure about alternative approaches, that rings an alarm for me because there are alternative approaches that are effective at improving school climate and in meeting student need. And we, and we, I mean a collective, all of us have to do a better job of making sure that students, teachers, parents, everyone knows and is aware. We've seen in Denver, in Oakland, in San Francisco, they've implemented restorative justice with fidelity to the model. That part is really key. There are a lot of places that say they're doing restorative justice, but it's in a very piecemeal way. But when you implement restorative practices with fidelity, it makes an impact. Um, there are 21 other states, four in New England, that have a better counselor to student ratio than Massachusetts. That's not acceptable given the resources we have in that state. So if you bolster personnel who are trusted personnel that young people feel comfortable in going to that's a part of safety why because you're again addressing the root causes of behavior so to me more mental and mental health supports more behavioral health supports more counselors social workers and really making schools more restorative those are the best practices that are working elsewhere and i firmly believe could work here thank you um and thank you for highlighting the importance of sometimes it's not just about you know taking on the initiative the implementation is just as important so uh thank you for elevating that um uh rep vargas i'm curious so you shared initially a little bit about your sort of key takeaways and you've heard about what our panelists um have said uh today so i your my question from for you is how do you see the legislative precision to respond to some of these issues in the next couple of months Sure, I just want to touch on um, something that Leon was hitting on around um, research proven methods to deal with safety and lack of security in our communities. Um, it brings me back to 2018 after Parkland happened. Um, there was a robust conversation happening on Beacon Hill on, around how do we respond, right? How do we, we got to do something, right? We had a, a lot of, and I say this in a very uh, kind way, um, suburban parents writing in saying we got to harden our schools um, and in my district I had young people saying you know we hear you know you're moving money to put metal detectors in schools because of gun violence but we experience gun violence every other weekend in our neighborhoods where's where's the money for that right and um, that same summer uh, we had lost a, a young man named Nike to gun violence in my community and so we took that story up to, to Beacon Hill um, and we worked with my colleagues in the House, in the Senate and Governor Baker at the time who was trying to move a school security sub through um, to create a new $10 million gun violence prevention program within the Department of Public Health, not in the Executive Office of Public Safety, but within the Department of Public Health. Um, and that program has really been a model um, for other states uh, to look at gun violence from a public health lens and not just directly about you know, the, the individuals that we know are, you know, uh, have, have a propensity for violence, but the people on the perimeter, right, their family members, their uh, partners, um, their neighbors, 
And so it's intentionally called the Neighborhood Gun Violence Prevention Program uh, within the Department of Public Health. And we just increased that line item to a $13 million annual line item from the 10 million that we started in 2018 as a SUP. Um, and that's sort of an example of how you can use lived experiences and stories um, at the local level and uplift them in a manner that really resonates with folks. Uh, but it wasn't a guarantee that that was going to be annualized, right? That, that was in a SUP that we did, um, and it's become an annualized uh, program uh, since then. Um, but I think the other thing that kind of spoke to me on the SRO issue is in, in my district as well, a few years ago, we had an SRO um, tell students uh, that were undocumented that they could get in trouble. Uh, and several of us rallied around our students and uh, had that SRO removed. <laughs> Um, now, in that same school, when I talked to parents uh, about whether or not they wanted the SRO replaced, um, majority of Latino parents said, yes, don't just remove him, but bring another one, right? We, we, we feel safer having an SRO there. And so how, how, we, we have to think about how we grapple with that. What do we what do, we do with that? Um, and to the current SRO's credit who's there, it was amazing, um, Latina, Dominican, you know, school resource officer, well-trained, is doing an incredible job and has has great relationships with the students that are there. And so I think there's a lot of nuance in this um, and, and, and a lot of that has to be uh, broken out at the local level in conversations with parents and uh, with the nuance that it deserves on a school by school basis. In terms of legislation, which is the question, um, there are several pieces of legislation that um, you know are being discussed on Beacon Hill. There's the Educator Diversity Act, which we haven't talked about the impact of having a diverse workforce and what that does for students in creative, creating a positive and safe environment. Um, there's a, a bill we filed this week dealing with licensed mental health counselors in schools. I think few people know that there's two different licensing systems. There's the license uh, in mental health counseling, and then there's a kind of school counselor license that you get through DESI. And by and large, the coursework that both of those licenses have are pretty similar. The majority of the courses are similar. However, in order to go from being a school counselor to a licensed mental health counselor, in many cases, you have to get another master's. You have to take all these other classes. Uh, and it's a very tedious and difficult task. And so we're looking to do what some other states have done, which is align uh, those two uh, licenses so that more school counselors can become licensed mental health counselors to provide more of those services in schools, but then also draw down on Medicaid dollars uh, that then uh, schools are eligible for because they have licensed mental health counselors delivering those services. Um, so that's legislation that we've actually filed this week and uh, we're working with Senator Payano in, in the Senate, uh, Representative Hamilton in the House as well on that. Um, of course, we did universal school meals, which is I'm super excited about, knock on wood, we get done in the budget, uh, is a permanent thing that we have here in Massachusetts. We'll be only the fifth state to make it permanent. Um, and is a huge um, thing that I think not only helps deal with hunger, but also helps deal with the stigma and the social uh, conditions that are within our schools by removing the, the free lunch label from, from students. Um, so that's kind of some of the things at the top of my head. We have legislation looking at uh, de-escalation training for transportation. We didn't even get into transportation here, but I think you know transportation um, is a huge, 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 huge piece of this. And um, we need to talk more about the fact that there's a monopoly on transportation across the Commonwealth that, you know, the bus companies kind of divvy up the, the state and say, you know, this is your area, that's your area, we're not going to bid over there, we won't bid over there. And that creates incredibly high costs and low quality uh, for school districts, which is why we're seeing the things that we're seeing. Um, and so I've always said that, you know, for all the, the startup and innovation and venture capital money that exists here in Mass. We need some innovation and venture capital to go towards school transportation, please, because this is a space that is ripe for change, is ripe for innovation, is ripe for investment, uh, and is, is ripe for uh, competition, uh, because the, the folks that are suffering right now are students and our parents. Thank you, uh, Rep. Vargas, for your leadership, um, from sharing a little bit of what you're seeing on the ground. I think we, uh, many of us would agree that legislation plays a, such an important role in change making. Um, again, I got the time check, but I want to make sure that I wrap in at least one last question. Um, it's a little bit crazy, but we're already wrapping up the school year. And as we're thinking uh, about the fall, I'm just curious what you all think the key takeaway should be. I'll be very quick, I promise, um, as most politicians say. Um, the key takeaway is the Student Opportunity Act is still being phased in. Um, and the priorities for how that money gets spent 
are determined at the local level, right? We need folks locally to have those conversations with their school committee, with their superintendents, with their principals, to create the conditions so that parents and students can come to the table and feel invited to come to the table with those ideas and those solutions. Um, in Haverhill, for example, we're getting an additional $8.3 million this year. That's on top of the additional $8 million we got last year. So that's $16 million in new funding the last two fiscal years. Those conversations have to be led by parents, students, um, educators, folks on the ground that have solutions, and we have to create the conditions to, to allow that. Yeah. The conversation that we have around school safety must be inclusive of all of the pathways to achieving school safety. We can no longer perpetuate the idea that school safety is either hard in our schools beyond all recognition or doing nothing. That's a false dichotomy that has been advanced far too often. We have to stress and educate that there are alternative pathways. And again, we have to understand that the root cause of many of these issues comes down to student need and mental health. And we have to center. We cannot talk about education without focusing on the whole child and addressing the needs of the whole child is making sure that people, the students not only feel supported, but that they get the necessary support that they need, social, emotional, and behavioral, as well as academically. Uh, the takeaway that I'm getting from this is that, um, of course, parents and families want to be involved and they want their priorities to be heard. We're going to be going through some really difficult times in education in the next 24 months. The fiscal cliff is coming. All of the ESSER and ARP money that was received by the state, $1.8 million is going to be phased out. So all the additional supports that we got from the feds to help us recover from COVID, all of that is going away. And we're already seeing the results of that happening where in places like Brockton, you are laying off 130 teachers. You know, that's before this money even goes away. And in districts like Brockton, which are a perfect example of this, where you are having kids that are in schools that aren't safe by parent standards, and now we're taking away 130 teachers before we have even planned to deal with this fiscal cliff coming up. So if you think that these priorities right now are going to go away and what we wanna see, they're not. Um, and we're not seeing enough proactive planning around what's going to happen next. So if we plan to, if we fail to plan, we're going to plan to fail. And uh, I think parents and families are not going to take this lying down. So I would suggest to everybody that we all start working together, take these priorities seriously, what parents or fam and families are saying, so that we can get to work because it's going to be a tough road ahead. Lastly, um, Leon stole a little of my thunder about the whole child. Um, I was sitting here, I wrote down, we need to put the, the resources that addresses the, the whole individual, academically, socially, physically, mentally. Um, so I'll just end it that way. We need to put the resources um, to address the whole child. Thank you. Um, I think I definitely heard from all of you that there's definitely urgency uh to, to act and to do it collectively over the next couple of months to uh, address some of the issues that were raised by parents and to also dig a little deeper to continue to understand what it actually means uh rev vargas leon carrie richard thank you so much for taking the time to join us today i know some of us are still transitioning to the in-person i know i am mm -hmm. uh, uh events again so thank you for coming for sharing your your expertise, your experience, your perspectives. Um, now we're going to open it up for Q&A. So I'm going to ask uh, Steve to join us. So we have been getting a few uh, questions already um, from the Zoom chat, uh, but I'm going to just ask if there's any um, audience members here today that have a question. I'm going to open up with you. I see a couple hands. Yes. Um, thank you all. This was really informative and really great. Um, in the survey, I didn't see any questions around LGBT, LGBTQ students because um, this is there's a lot in my head trying to put it into something cohesive. There's local activism within our school district. I know the Lieutenant Governor ended up saying, like, oh, we have no divisiveness in our state. I'm like, we do. It's at the local level. 
Um, we have groups that are going after school districts that are doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work. It's happening in my district, it's happening in multiple districts, but it's all happening at the local level. Um, they're targeting work around affinity groups, student-run groups, LGBTQ stuff really, really badly. And I think that's also contributing to some of the anxiety and fear a lot of our students are fear fearing, like dealing with having protests against LGBTQ run student events. St those students aren't going to school because they're like at home scared. Um, targeting student run, uh, uh, when is students of color running something, being attacked by that by national groups. That's, that's one piece that's been growing and getting, I'd love to see sort of like more vision on that because it's not happening at state level it's really happening at the local level um and the second is i'd love to get your feedback like thoughts on the surgeon general just said social media big problem and with i know steve i really appreciate you saying that the the mental health crisis predated COVID. it just got exacerbated and now we just with COVID, we just said be on your screens 24 7 and then we're taking some of that stuff away i'd love to get like how do though that's why it's all in my head it's like all of these are like we're throwing in our we have all these things and then these other things like hey kids deal with that too i'd love to get your any of your feedback on this i am happy to jump into this i like we are on the front lines of a lot of this stuff um and the conversation with a lot of these hate groups that have popped up um which say they represent parents and really don't um, it's a political campaign that is preying on a moment for parents that are filled with fear and anxiety that our kids are not okay, that we're not addressing this moment with urgency and turning that anxiety and manipulating it into this like hate machine. We poll very often to quantify for people how big that movement is because it has outsized influence on this conversation. It is deeply distracting to the important and critical work we need to be doing right now for our kids. If we don't address this moment of COVID with urgency, 10 to 15 years from now, we're going to have kids who are unemployed, unemployable, and our communities are going to look a hell of a lot different. If you think we have a substance abuse problem right now, if we have kids that fail to launch we don't address this as the adults we're supposed to be with urgency, we're going to be in a world of hurt, a world of hurt. This is a political campaign. So we ask this question all the time. How many, like, how many parents are really deeply concerned about this stuff? And I'm sorry I get fired up. I'm the mom of a non-binary kid and a, a, a gay kid. It's just, it's painful to watch our children being used as fodder in this way. Um, it's, it's eight to, to 11 at most percent of, of families that even care about this stuff, which sounds about right. You probably have eight to 11% of the American public outwardly being racist, like, okay, lines up to me. But the idea that we allow these folks to hijack the conversation in the mic, it's to many of us, another act of white supremacy, where of course they, have, they can dominate the conversation and distract us around their agenda, because that's what happens. But they do not represent parents and families. Book banning, all of this crap. We ask these questions all the time at the National Parents Union. 74% of American families say parents, an individual parent should not have the right to take a book out of a library and ban it for everybody else. Like that's ridiculous. Only 36% of those families say they should even be able to ban it for their own kid. Like you shouldn't be able to have that kind of influence in American public education. So I would say what you're seeing is a concerted political campaign um and it's up to us like we got to create the space and march in with the truth and and like i i spend a lot of time talking with state chiefs across the country saying stop giving these folks out doing like make, make you filled with fear and, and make you create policies and and not be as courageous as we need you to be for our kids and protective of our kids because you're fearing the 10 percent like that's not what this moment calls for so i'm sorry i'm getting like this for me is a lot. You don't apologize for your passion. Oof. I would just add that I think it speaks to the point I was mentioning earlier is that we don't spend the time enough time focusing on local elections, right? Like we have to create the conditions so that school committees, superintendents know that this is a very small minority of people in their community that don't reflect uh, what the community uh, believes. Um, and that's hard, right? I mean, there's a reason why, you know, not to get partisan here, Republicans love local control. 
because their people turn out and ours don't, right? And so what, how do we create the conditions so that we can change voter turnout at the local level and not just at the ballot box, but at school committee meetings, at you know school family engagement nights? What are the things that we can do as leaders either at the state level or at the local level to ensure that we're inviting that kind of participation to, to ensure that we have true representation of the community and not this uh, over amplified um, uh, example? Just uh, to quickly add, add one thing. Um, first of all, uh, Carrie, thank you so much for the polling that you all do at the national level. It just adds so much to the, the conversation and on questions like this that we don't have the chance to ask here in Massachusetts. It really does show, you know, the size of the groups, which is a big, uh, it's kind of a, a big point of polling. You never know if you're just at the local meeting and people are shouting like, how many of them are there actually? Like what percentage of the population is made up by the loudest people? Um, Cause we certainly hear from them a lot. Um, but uh, um, as Representative Vargas points out, uh, local elections matter, you know, and the electorate that shows up at local mm -hmm. elections pretty much everywhere is older, it's whiter and it's wealthier mm -hmm. than the electorate as a whole and particularly more than the population as a whole. You know, once you kind of step from local elections up to state, up to national, up to the full population, you know, uh, it gets more and more diverse. But the people who are choosing those state, those school committee members, you know, that that does tend to be who who uh, is represented there. I mean, I also wanted to say I appreciate the, the um, suggestion about social media use. That's a good um, sort of a good thing for us to think about for a future poll. I'll just quickly add one other point. When we look at available data that we have, I think we have to acknowledge the moment and that the LGBT plus community is currently under siege and that is absolutely impacting our young people. And I think we really could do more to make sure that our data is reflective of the outcomes of young people who identify as LGBTQ plus, as well as young people at the intersection, because there's, you know, sexual orientation, gender identity and race, for example, we really need to be able to look at those outcomes and see where this type of treatment is having a negative impact on that particular group of young people. Thank you. And I'm going to take um, a question from Zoom. Um, however, I want to recognize that not everybody feels comfortable maybe asking their questions out loud. So if you prefer, you can scan the barcode as well and submit your question uh, via the app. Um, so the question is, are Massachusetts school districts effectively using the state funds provided by the SOA to address the issues raised today? What more, what more or different can they do? No. <laughs> um, we see things like um, money for the ESSER and ARP money instead of being used that was supposed to be earmarked for things like mental health support, used for things like school hardening, adding additional SROs. Like, when you're not, again, when, when we created this whole process and people were supposed to be coming up with plans for how to use this ESSER and ARP money, it was actually built in there. We were yelling and screaming that we needed to have parent and family input in the, the planning. So when you actually submitted it, like it, it would have this. And you know that went, as you can imagine, it was a lot of box checking and, oh yeah, we, we sent out surveys and got 10 back. And so now we know how parents feel. It was a mess. Um, and so now when we come into the actual spend down and watching how these re resources are being allocated, we're, we're watching very closely and, and calling for transparency and accountability around where these dollars have been spent and whether we got bang for our buck. I would argue that the results that we're seeing right now and what we're seeing reflected in the survey tells us that parents aren't seeing enough urgency, that parents aren't aren't seeing for like, you know, I just said the other day, if, if schools in Massachusetts got $1.8 billion in additional funding, it's like hitting the mega bucks, right? Like if I if I hit the lottery, you know, my living room might look different. I might get some new furniture. I might not even live there anymore. I might move someplace else, get something fancy, right? parents are not feeling the impact of that money the way that we, we would think like in additional supports you know different strategies all of these things so that's something that we've we've seen reflected in our polling anyone else like to add i think that um carrie that does align a lot with what we heard from parents in previous polls and focus group when we asked the question around do you see these funds being sort of spent on things that you find effective many parents said i just don't know how to answer 
Um, so I, I that doesn't definitely resonates. I think we have time for one more audience question and, and then we'll have to wrap up. Does anyone else have a question they would like to pose? Uh, thank you so much for outlining the content. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I was going to use my Peter voice. Um, thank you so much for outlining the complexities and challenges that we face. I work for an education nonprofit where one of our organizational values is optimism. So I just would like to ask you all, what gives you hope? I love that. Maybe yeah, that's a great way to close. <laughs> uh, I love this question. Um, I, was, I always uh, bring up Winston Churchill who said, I'm an optimist because it does not seem too much use to be anything else. Um, what gives me hope are students, number one. Um, I'm going to a civics project showcase tonight in Haverhill, uh, which I'm really excited about, which is a result of the 2018 civics education law that we passed. Uh, and when you talk to these students, they have real ideas. Um, they have real solutions uh, and they know what they need. Um, and so just spending time with students gives me hope. Um, and then I'm also um, hopeful because I'm married to an educator and she just won't quit. Uh, and I see the stories that she brings home um, the impact that she's having on her students, um, the fact that, you know, she could go elsewhere, but has, you know, decided to stick around this long in a very difficult environment, um, that gives me hope. I echo that young people always give me optimism. Um, this is my 23rd year working with and on behalf of young people as an attorney and an advocate and just the sheer potential of young people. And as the rep said, um, the best part of my month has been going to movements that have been organized by young people where they are expressing what they want and they need. And so young, so these things that we're talking about, more mental health supports, more restorative justice, young people are taking to the streets, young people are taking to social media, and they are asking for these things. So my job is easy just having their back and uplifting the things that they want i think two <laughs> things um very quickly um you know the fact that parents are continuing to show up and ask questions and are remaining curious and are staying engaged i i think that's a beautiful thing um nationally our organization we started out with about 185 parent groups across the country. Now we're up over a thousand affiliated organizations, all 50 states, DC, Puerto Rico. You know, we have an epic campaign, Everyday Parents Impacting Change. Every day parents are signing up so that they can be informed. So when they go to the school board, they can ask questions around ESSER and ARP and say, well, I'm very concerned about like grade level reading or that we're using balanced reading instead of structured literacy. Like what, like asking really deep, good questions and that urgency is not going away. The other thing is community organizations that sprouted up and did so much more during the pandemic are continuing to do more. Like not all of this rests on, you know, our public education system. Like we see community organizations that are continuing to step up and innovate and support our kids in new ways. And they're so creative and now have become this vibrant part of the educational ecosystem that I want to see more of and want to see are supporting more as well. What gives me hope as a parent is that um, young kids are just amazing as as much as we're talking about today. Um, if you look back when you were a child, um, generations back, um, we have the ability to overcome. It's just a lot much easier when we work together, when we have the necessary resources but um, it's just great being a dad. Every day I'm teaching her, she's teaching me. And um, we're just, we embrace the opportunity um, to educate her and, and look forward to her future. And, and that's what we need to do as a society. We can't just sit back and, and just worry about our individual selves. We need to worry about everybody be, because it comes back to affect us um one way or another in our lives so we need to just care for each other care for the young people and and do our best and i just add to the uh, very eloquent things that have already been said um, first of all to echo each one of them um, i have three kids and certainly they uh they bring me optimism and then just to add to that it's uh, the people in this room and the the fact that in massachusetts this does matter to us you know this matters to 
our elected representatives, it matters to who we think of ourselves as um, as residents of Massachusetts, that education matters. So we're not there, it's not perfect, but we're striving and we're working. Um, and that also gives me optimism. Uh, thank you. I think both from what we heard in the poll and, and shared from the panelists today, I think there's a lot of work to do, but I love that we ended on a high note of unity and that there is a lot of promise both from our educators and also um, our, our students uh, throughout the state, which, which are doing amazing things despite some of the things that were shared today. So that is all the time we have today. I want to thank you all again for uh, all our panelists. Um, Steve, on behalf of the Education Trust, thank you, Mass Inc., for always being a, a great partner and for everyone that joined us today. Um, I know that Mass Inc. is always doing a variety of polls on different topics, including we'll be doing another uh, education poll later on in the fall. And I know a lot of you sort of uh, I, I know my mind is sort of going to the areas that we missed that we can probe a little bit deeper, both in focus groups and, and polls. So I'm looking forward to it. If any of the information um, today you miss, whether that was a presentation um, or the cross tabs or anything you would like to find could be found both in the Ed Trust Massachusetts and the Mass Inc. polling group website. Um, a special thanks again to the Bar Foundation for um, supporting our work throughout uh, the eighth uh, poll in the series. And again, thank you all for joining us. That's all for today.